Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I thought I would do a follow-up to the last episode of Greg in Your Ear because it was political and I got some responses. Uh, some, some of my responses are crazy and some of them are a little bit more articulate. So I thought that I would discuss uh, kind of where I'm coming from and, and state kind of uh, what, my deal it is, what my deal is with our nation's self-proclaimed deal maker. Because, um, like, I, I have a lot of pragmatic reasons for disliking Trump as a president. And what most people get really wrapped up in are the social issues and kind of the, the scaremongering and stuff like that. So I saw, like, people talking about, like, oh, no, no, he is, he is law and order. Blah, blah, blah. And I'll, I'll get into that. Uh, I've got a little list here. It's a short list. We're not going to go on for a long time because there's, there's really only so much you can say. And then you kind of have to... Uh, pack it up. There's more room for satire than there is for just bald-faced uh, uh, political discussion. So, uh, well, I mean, unless you really want to get deep, 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 deep into things, but most people don't. Let's be honest. So, uh, anyway, we'll go ahead and we'll stop. We'll start with the whole um, globalism thing. Because when Donald Trump first got into office, that was around when, uh, like, like Obama was uh, negotiating the TTP, and I remember being interested in that and keeping an eye on it. And the TTP and a lot of these global agreements are very frustrating because they're all kind of negotiated behind closed doors among sort of the powerful movers and shakers of, of the various countries. So it's like they, they set themselves out to kind of figure out what the economy is going to do and how everyone's going to be treated on a global level, but without any kind of like you know, union input or workers input or, or, you know, like the people really don't get to be a part of it. It's all sort of a secret. And then they sign the agreement. And they say like, okay, so from now on, Walmart can go to these, these countries with like really bad uh, regulatory environments and they can just like dump chemicals straight into the oceans, you know, and that'll be fine. And we can't do that in the United States. So, so here in the United States, they, what they'll do is they'll just pack up all the factories and they'll move them all over to, uh, you know, Vietnam or whatever. They talk about labor costs. Like, they talk about how, oh, well, people there don't get paid a lot, and that's why we're moving over there. But that's a little bit of snake oil. They, they really don't move over to China for the labor costs, because when you look at the numbers, the labor costs are not really one of the... They're not one of the biggest things that goes into the cost of a product these days. So many things are automated that uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot of labor costs can kind of be replaced with machinery anymore. So the reason you see people go into these countries with, with very relaxed environmental regulations and stuff like that is because they can, they can dump their chemical byproducts and whatnot, uh, or they can use chemical processes that are dangerous or do a lot of harm, and, uh, but are very, very cheap. So like all the reagents that go into making your product, they, you, they're like, so much cheaper than if you were doing a like a safe environmentally friendly uh, chemical sort of thing and so a lot of a lot of uh, chemical stuff factory stuff things like that they've gone overseas specifically to exploit uh, a lack of regulation and globalism has, has kind of helped promote and and sustain that in a lot of ways I mean you get into uh, like Hillary Clinton lost the election and I, I firmly believe that she deserved to lose like she earned that loss she acts like she didn't, but she sat on the board of directors for Walmart at a time when they were moving a lot of their production over to China to specifically take advantage of this stuff. And so we kind of get into globalism, and globalism could be good. And this was what Obama was saying when he was getting criticism for the TTP, is he was saying like, well, you know, don't criticize it yet, it could be good. You know, like you won't get to see what's in it, and certainly what you have seen, it doesn't look like it's going to be good, but it could in theory be good. And he's, he's right, it could be good. If you had like a, if you were setting a global standard and you were saying like, okay, so in all these nations, you know, East and West, we're all going to agree, we're not going to just dump chemicals in the ocean. Well, that would put everyone kind of on an even playing field. So long as, you, so long as everyone's following the rules and they're not just like doing these dangerous chemical processes, that sets an equal field so that every company has to use these, these safer uh, sort of processes and then, uh, and then one company doesn't get undercut by like somebody in China or whatever. Like, because China has no environmental regulations at all, so they can make a much cheaper product and just undercut you once they get into your market. Uh, and and that's just with their processes. That's not even getting into their whole um, mixed market socialist capitalism thing that they're doing right now, which is also crazy. Um, so so the whole like globalism thing 
Trump kind of railed against it, but while he was railing against it, it's not like he ever really fully grasped or understood what the exact problems were. Like, there's a lot of problems with the way that we've approached this, but, but they're kind of the complexity of it is on a higher level than what Trump ever engaged with. He mostly kind of goes after it in the sense of just like, well, I don't like foreigners, you know, I don't like other nations. And uh, it's not really the correct mindset. What actually probably needed to happen is, is globalism really is going to be uh, the future. Either that or I guess a global war. But, but you know, the, the eventually eventually someone will win the war or enough people will be dead or I don't know. Like, uh, well, globalism is kind of the future or we all die, I guess. I don't know. Like, we're connected to the internet. I can speak to people over in Russia, like, right now if I wanted. Like, I know, I know, a pe like, I know people who live in Russia. I know people who live in, like, you know, Poland, Finland, uh, France, wherever. I can talk to people all over the world, you know. And so we're getting to be more involved with each other. Like, you can make friends with people in other nations and everything. So, so your interactions are definitely going to be more and more global. That's just the way that things are going to be. The big question is not whether or not we are going to be global. The question is how are we going to be global? What are we going to agree on? What are going to be the rules as we all have to start interacting a lot more often? And uh, our nations have really failed so far to embrace rules that are good for the people generally. They've mostly focused on embracing rules that, that produce capital for the big movers and shakers at the top of the chain. So uh, if, if Trump were focused on like, well, let's let's make sure that the standards we're setting are to the benefit of everyone involved then that would be then that would be what i would want to hear about and then i'd be pleased with his his kind of his anti-treaty he's like i'm going to strike down the ttp and i'm going to negotiate something that really is better for the general populace rather than just for my my personal you know stock holdings then that would be good but i never see that out of him i've never heard anything like that from him i don't think he thinks like that i don't believe that's his stance um, I also don't really believe that's the stance of, of the, uh, the major portion of the left wing either. So it's very frustrating for me as, uh, as, as someone who pays attention to politics to say like, well, this is what I want, knowing that I'm, I'm not really going to see that. But uh, that's, that's what I'd like to see. Um, this, this whole thing that they do where they blame like other peoples for all this is really just sort of a scapegoat. So when they say like, oh, well, you know, the Mexicans are the problem, you know, they're, they're coming over here and they're stealing your jobs and whatnot. Uh, like the Mexicans coming up to do like housework and, and farming jobs that are like really labor intense and stuff like that. They're really not having such an impact on the, like they're, they're not, they're not competing with jobs to the extent that they're really wiping out the American worker. Uh, what's devastating the American worker is factories and things being shipped over to China to take advantage of, of really lax regulatory schema. Uh, this is, though, why you see a lot of people on the right wing talking about why regulations need to vanish entirely. Um, they're, not, they're not trying to do that because they're wanting to expand a free market. It's because if they get rid of the environmental regulations, then uh, although it's a huge detriment to the health of the people who live in the nation, like, I mean, we all know how polluted China is and how much it sucks to be in some of the, the worst areas for that. Uh, although it's a major de 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 uh, although it's a major detriment to the people, uh, it's really great for getting a cheaper product and then having higher margins on the product. So it's 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 a great thing for like a stockholder for someone who's rich and invested into the the market. And that's why they talk about wanting to deregulate because they want to be able to compete with China and uh, and make more money, you know, up at the top level. But it's it's not good for the rest of us, and it's really not something that we we should be embracing, in my opinion. Uh, so. so anyway, next on my list, um, the whole international thing with Trump, speaking about the way that he, he approaches other nations, uh, like he talks about all these, all these other countries and everything that they're doing wrong and how he's going to set things right, but the way that he approaches stuff is really weird. He likes the strongman persona. And I think he himself wants to be seen as like a strongman. And he doesn't really understand what the what the representative republic nations are, are trying to do because everything that they do is so complicated it's like everyone's a representative of something so you go and you speak to the president of uh, france and and he has power but it's like limited power so you can't just be like hey make this rule change he's like well i can bring it up with parliament and then uh, you know the french citizenry will riot and then after the riots, we'll have a referendum. And then, you know, so it's it's just kind of like it's a whole it's a whole thing. 
you know, you have to do politics and negotiate and think it through and everything else. But when Trump can interact with the dictators, it's just him and the dictator. And and Trump likes to believe that he's this really clever diplomat. He's this he's this amazing deal maker. And past evidence over many years has demonstrated that he's really not a very smart guy. Like he's not very savvy. He's not actually a very good deal maker. He has a lot of publicists and and things like a lot of people who work PR for him on his behalf who can help bolster up his image and kind of convince the public that he's a smart guy. But one on one, you see a lot of evidence that he just he just does not know what he's doing. And so uh, one of the ways that that came out really, really clearly was with his interactions with North Korea. Uh, I mentioned before that I had this book on our North Korean relationships, and uh, it was called The Impossible State by Victor Cha. And Victor Cha is like a, a scholar, and I think a, I think he was a former diplomat or something like that. I can't remember what all his credentials were. But the whole book, it just talks about like uh, the first three generations of North Korean leadership and uh, the book ends just as Kim Jong-un is coming into power. And it's kind of like, so we'll get to see what sort of leader Kim Jong-un is. And when Trump assumed power, we, we still didn't really know what kind of man Kim Jong-un was going to be. Because he'd stayed kind of quiet. And there had been some executions. And so the question was, what sort of politics was he executing? You know, like, clearly this was still a dictatorship, but, but who was he killing? Like, what direction is he going to go? Was he just establishing his power base? Or is he paving the way for some reforms or something like that? So we didn't, you know, we didn't know. And it was fair to kind of go into the whole thing with this maybe like, well, maybe things will be fresh. Maybe something's going to change. But uh, if, you, if you follow the cycle of interactions with like North Korean politics, if you look back at, for example, the Clinton years, they were trying to negotiate nuclear disarmament with North Korea back then as well. And what North Korea was doing at that time is they were building these uh, nuclear plants and they were trying to bring in enriched plutonium. And they were like, no, no, we need enriched plutonium to build these weapons. Or, excuse me, we need them for power plants, is what they said. They insisted they were for power plants. Power, for power. It's not for weapons, they're for power. And so uh, the Clinton administration tried to negotiate with them. And they said, well, if you want power, like, you know, that's, that's a fairly reasonable thing to want. We'll actually help you if you agree to follow these rules and let us inspect so we know that you're not building nuclear bombs, we will help you build graphite nuclear power plants, which are nuclear power plants that use carbon instead of like plutonium or uranium, you know, the stuff you build weapons with. And North Korea was like, eh, you know, I don't know, maybe ease up on some of these sanctions, we'll think about it, you know, do this. So they kind of, they get these concessions and then at the end of it all, they built the plutonium power plants, and they had the plutonium, and they you know, they were building weapons. They just kept on building weapons. So they squirrel around like that, and that's just been the way that, that it always goes. They say, well, we'll ease up a little bit, you know, give us a break, send us some food, you know, help us out, and then we'll do what you want. And so you, you get this with not just the United States, but you also see South Korea was doing the same thing. And so South Korea had this thing they were doing called the Sunshine Policy, where they were attempting to provide aid to North Korea and sort of, you know, put on a friendly face and try to embrace them as their, their, you know, their brothers. And then North Korea would accept the aid and make these promises, but then the promises would always fall through. North Korea would never actually hold up to any of their ends of the bargain. Like, they, they never did. And so this is how it's been. It, like, through the Bush administration, the Clinton administration, uh, and, and prior to, they've really never, they've never really held up their end of any deal. They just ask for things. And uh, like even way back when the Soviets were still a thing, they would kind of get in these tussles and they would mismanage stuff and there would be the starvation. And they turned to the Soviets and say, hey, send us food. You know, we need help. So they'd get help from the Soviets. Uh, these days they turn to China more often. And then what China does is China kind of use them as a, like they have a lot of natural resources. So China will exploit their natural resources, and they also kind of like North Korea as a buffer state, you know, because then they, they don't have, like, American bases directly bordering them, because we've got American bases in South Korea for, for that, you know, whole global thing. And, and so they, they kind of like North Korea as a buffer state, and so they kind of want North Korea to stay a thing, and they just go in there and they take some of their resources sometimes, and it's, it's not like a really great relationship, but it, they prop North Korea up a little bit. So... North Korea is like this big complicated thing, and they've never really done anything that warranted a presidential visit. So like no no US president has ever really gone to sit in with the leader of North Korea because acknowledging them 
is supposed to be something they get after they finally hold up their end of the deal. Like, at least one time. <laughs> like, once they once they do something that they agreed to do, that's when they get to meet with the president, who says, you know, thanks, you know, for, for cooperating. So, uh, what they were doing, though, is they believed that once they built nuclear weapons that the Western world would see them as equals. Because, you know, okay, now we can blow you up, so that means you have to treat us like we're on the same level as you. And, and that's been kind of their guiding policy with the nuclear weapons program, and that's been the really big trouble with trying to get them to disarm. Because, you know, no diplomat has been able to convince them that that wasn't the case. It's, it's just been like, well, you know, we'll build the nukes and then you'll treat us like we're, we're on the same level as you. So they built a nuke that was capable of reaching the United States, and then President Trump went to go meet with Kim Jong-un personally and congratulate him for having such a beautiful nation and being such an amazing leader. And they got all that on footage, and it, it, it vindicated their nuclear weapons program. And and uh, that wasn't the only messaging that, that vindicated them. You also had this whole debacle with Iran, where Iran had agreed to a nuclear disarmament treaty, and, uh, and, and when Trump pulled out of it, there was no evidence that they weren't upholding their bargain. Like, it appeared that they were actually following the rules of the treaty. And then uh, Trump threw a fit at him. And, you know, he, he put on sanctions on them. He bullied them and he kicked them around. He disrespected them. And so here's Iran, who actually does... They used to have factions in government that were pro-Western and wanted to normalize relationships with the West. And they were pushed back against that. They were, they were not the strongest faction in government, but they did exist. There were people in Iran who wanted to be on good terms with the U.S. And so here was Iran that actually had factions in government that could that could have some sway that wanted to be friends with the United States. And they were taking it seriously and they were trying to uphold these rules and these bargains. And Trump kicks dirt in their eyes. And then he goes to North Korea and he says, you guys, you guys are awesome. You know, and he, he praises them. So the message internationally is just that the, the United States under President Trump were total fools. And that we don't respect people who who don't have who don't have nuclear bombs, and uh, and it's it's really bad because this this sends the clear picture that if you want to get ahead, then you need to build bombs, and and don't pay attention to any of this talk about nuclear disarmament because you're just gonna get you're just gonna get spat in the face once you start to disarm. So um, it was terrible diplomacy, like it was the dumbest possible diplomacy. It was it was just infuriating. To, to watch it play out, but this is this is how Trump did things because he's not he probably didn't really know what was going on. Like I know he's got people who could tell him what's going on, but he notoriously doesn't pay attention. So he screwed everything up and then and then went on Twitter and crowed about what a great president he was because he did these things and he knew he knew why he did them. And then he told his base, like, you know, I told Iran to take a hike. You know, they're an adversarial nation to us and they deserve this. And, and they are kind of, they are an adversarial nation to us. We have a lot of tension with them, or have had a lot of tension with them. You know, they, they've they been a major problem for us in the Middle East ever since we've gotten there. And so if you just look at that at, at the face value, and you're like, okay, yeah, sure, they're an adversary, and uh, we're fighting them, okay. You know, it sounds good. And, and to Trump, it probably sounded good. He probably had no idea what he did wrong, and he was just like, I did a good thing. I'm, a, and I'm an amazing diplomat. You know, Trump is always right. And his supporters were like, yeah, see, you did a great thing. But, uh, like I say, if you know kind of more about some of the nuance in the whole, in all the diplomacy, it was just like, this This was the dumbest thing. This was the dumbest, dumbest possible thing. <laughs> so, uh, a lot of his international diplomacy is, is like that. He doesn't really seem to understand, like, he doesn't know what NATO does. He doesn't, he didn't really understand the World Trade Organization. He just kind of like, he's dismantling this stuff and taking apart important sort of parts of, of the United States influence over the world and and people go there well like well why should we be the world police anyway but it wasn't even like world police stuff it was like the soft power aspects like the things where we're just like hey would you mind doing this for us it would help us out diplomatically and then other nations say like well you know well you do run NATO so okay and they cooperate with us and, and Trump just made it like completely transactional and it was like well why aren't you putting enough money in and then the other NATO nations were like, are you kidding? Like, you're kind of in charge around here. What? <laughs> like, like, yeah, we don't always meet our obligations, but, you know, diplomatically, this gives you so much leverage. Why are you taking a, why are you taking a dump on us? You know? So he kind of threw away all the diplomatic leverage because he wanted, like, money paid into NATO 
and now it's like, well, all right, so you're losing a grip on NATO, and now you have no diplomatic leverage, and uh, and the, the whole purpose of NATO is, is falling apart because of you, so this is just very stupid. Um, and he's, he's done so many things, it was actually kind of funny that at one point, uh, I can't remember when this was, but as Trump was doing all this stuff, uh, Vladimir Putin himself commented, he was saying like, well, you know, the United States, they've been powerful for a long time, but when a nation makes enough small mistakes, they may not realize it, but they've lost control. And uh, he was speaking about the United States at the time, and so Vladimir Putin's assessment was that Trump was successfully dismantling a lot of the forces that, that were kind of there to manage Russia as an adversary, because Russia is quite powerful as an adversary, so is China, but we haven't had as much leverage. Like, uh, China is kind of a, you know, they're, they're a little bit further away, and we don't have as much presence, whereas, whereas with Russia, our interactions with Europe are important there, and so the European Union is kind of an important counterbalance to Russia. Anyway, anyway, uh, so Trump doesn't know anything about what's going on out there. He, he kind of demonstrates repeatedly that he doesn't know what's going on out there, but a lot of his, a lot of his believers, I don't think, really know very well what's going on out there either, so when he talks about what a great job he's doing, they assume, yeah, okay, you're doing a really good job, but, but to be honest, um, a chimp could do what Trump is doing. Like, uh, like if you just, if you just, <laughs> if you paid a chimp to throw poop at everyone in a room, uh, you know, everyone would leave just as angry as when Trump walked in. It, it really isn't very hard to do what Trump does. He's not building anything. He's just tearing stuff down and making a lot of problems. And everyone's kind of trying to pick up the pieces after he storms out. So it's it's just chaos and stupidity, and it's not really like good leadership. It's it's not moving towards anything. He doesn't have a plan. He doesn't really know what he's doing. He's he's just. You say a, ch a chimp could do it, and it would be just as good. Like it, anyone could do what Trump has done as president on the international level. So then we get into the economy, where people talk about like, well, the economy was really good because Trump Trump loves to brag about how good the economy was before you know the first big crisis. And uh, the crisis thing is is one of those deals that's really strange because. When you look at kind of like talks about the president, they say like every presidency has some sort of crisis and the way you handle that crisis really kind of defines your presidency as far as like what's what's going to be your legacy. And uh, we've actually had a few crises with Trump and he's he's really fumbled every single one of them. But the economy has gone on if you use the metrics that they like to use as far as like, well, the stock market has been doing really good. And uh, this one was a smoke and mirrors one. This one really this one really bothered me because I, I had a guy on Facebook who was all he was all excited because he was like, Yeah, you know, the Trump tax cuts are really gonna juice the economy. And then after the tax cuts, all the companies that got these tax cuts, they just used them for stock buybacks. And that was like they talk about that being a really frustrating thing. They're like, oh, that shouldn't have been what the companies did. Shame on the companies. But if you were paying attention, that was that was exactly what was supposed to happen. Because the recovery had been going on for a long time, and it had been very top-heavy, there was a lot of discussion before the tax cuts about what the next crash was going to look like, and they were kind of anticipating it as a crash, because they were saying, well, we've got a lot of debt in the markets, and there's not really a lot of spending power going to the lower rungs. It's mostly concentrating at the top, and so sooner or later you're gonna find that this this is it's a little top heavy and it's gonna topple. And so they were saying like, is it gonna be a bad crash? Is it gonna be like a minor recession that we come out of? You know, when is it coming? What's it gonna do? So they did the big tax cut. And then the companies bought their stocks, they bought back their own stocks, which juiced the stock prices. And this did kind of stimulate the appearance of the economy because it, it boosted up stock prices and made lots more money for those people at the top. But the economy is still built at the top now. It's, it's very top heavy and it's not really geared towards, towards uh, the general populace. So it kept it going. And, and my take was that that whole thing that they did, like they were talking about like, oh, we're supposedly at the peak of a recovery. Why are we doing tax cuts now? It was because they wanted to keep the economy going on this recovery until after November. And that was kind of what they were going for because it can take a while for an economy to sort of just to, to slide down. 
and aside from that, like macroeconomics is really weird. Macroeconomics is like global, national economics, these types of things. There, it's not really well understood. There are models that try to predict it, but most of the models are not very good. They're not very accurate because it's it's hard to really understand. Like so many companies are secretive about what's going on. I mean, if you think about YouTube alone, it's practically a black box. You can't you can't hardly look inside it to know what they're doing. Like the money is being passed around. Like Google has money. Is is YouTube profitable though? It's believed they are now. It's thought that they're profitable now, but even with the data that they've that they've let slip out. It's still really hard to say. So a lot of the economy, even with just one company, can be difficult to predict and understand. And when you get on a national level, it's very difficult for a particular presidency or a, or a party to really control the economy. So you can do things like you can juice the economy with a tax cut or with a stimulus package or whatever. But you know, it's there's no guarantee that the economy is is necessarily going to grow in one particular way or another. It's hard to predict how all that is going to work. You know. Sometimes they give a subsidy for alpaca farming, and then everyone opens up an alpaca farm, and then you've got this overabundance of alpacas, and it's just it's just crazy. So, uh, so as Trump, any president who really claims credit for a good economy is is kind of blowing smoke up your ass. They're not they they don't really know how to control the economy. You know, whatever their policies are, they could be coasting off of something that happened ten years ago. You know, maybe there's some bit like the tech boom was a big deal, and so they had no control over the tech boom. It was just happening, and you could take credit for it, but that would be a lie. And so Trump taking credit for the economy is just—it's something that every politician does, and it's—it's it's never really honest, but it's just something that they do. Um, what the Republicans particularly like, though, is they often like to refer to the Laffer curve, which is this theory that. Uh, the less you tax people, the more disposable income that they'll have to spend on the economy, and this this produces gains in the economy. And to some extent, this could be true. There's there's actually a right wing way that you could approach a a recovery or a stimulus that would be beneficial for the people, and it's mainly rather than a massive tax cut for the rich that blows away everything you've ever seen before, you would give a big tax cut to the lower class. And if you did that, that would free up spending for the lower class, and that could potentially stimulate the economy because then you have some buying power back in the general populace again. Tax cuts for the rich don't generally do much of anything, uh, but they they like to act like it will. It's that trickle down kind of thing. And uh, I don't know why why general people. I assume for the same reason that they think. I assume people get excited about the tax cuts for the rich for the same reason they get excited about Trump's like international diplomacy because they don't really know what's going on there and they're just like, yeah, no, that's great. You know, tax cuts for the rich. Well, we're all gonna benefit eventually. Um, you don't. You could ask for tax cuts, like legitimately. If if you believe in tax cuts is the way forward, that is, some economists honestly and earnestly think that a tax cut for the lower class would be the way to go. But very few respected economists think that the rich need more help. And uh, even some of the rich are at this point saying that they don't need any more help and are yet getting and they're getting more help anyway. Um, I think that both both sides of the aisle struggle a lot with tax plans or uh, any kind of stimulus plan that aids the lower classes. They mostly focus on their political donors, in my opinion. And, uh, and and so this is the thing. This is why I say like I understand those of you who really hate the left wing because they really haven't done anything to garner your appreciation. Like uh, like you know you can talk about well should you vote for Biden and it's like I don't I don't like know for sure what Biden's gonna bring to the table that I could be thrilled about. I'm not necessarily like if he gets into office come come four years when it's that time again for another election. I'm not necessarily gonna be rooting for the guy. Uh, because if he if he just creates a big stimulus plan for the top portion of the economy and is like there we saved the stock market again, uh, I'm not going to be terribly impressed. But tax cuts for the rich are worthless. Bailout plans for the rich also worthless. And so the Democrats like to bail out the rich. The Republicans like to give tax cuts to the rich. And together they are completely wasting our time. So. Um, yeah, I mean, people talk about, like, Economics 101 a lot, especially Republicans love this. They're like, Economics 101, supply and demand. And whenever someone talks like that, I can always tell they never really took an economics course because Economics 101 gets a lot into uh, what we actually do know about markets and how they work and, and why certain things won't produce certain results that you want to see. 
you you get into things like there's your sort of like widget markets which are always competitive and a widget market uh basically you want the government to act as a referee in a widget market to make sure that everyone's always competing um widget markets can become monopolies if you just if you just sit back and let it happen uh and and what that basically means is like suppose you have some company and they get a little bit more buying power than another company or where they're selling below costs because they're they have profits from some other industry and they wipe out all their competitors and now there's now widget co is you know oligopolmart is the only company around and uh, they're a total monopoly uh well the securities and exchange commission they kind of they're a little bit weird in that they don't really crack down on anti-competitive pro- uh, practices now because the question they ask is like uh is this harmful to the consumer and pricing below costs it, it used to be something they considered against the rules but now they allow it because it's it's good for the consumer while it's happening but then it wipes out all the competitors and then you have a monopoly and then they stop pricing below cost and they begin to gouge prices and when there's only one company you know can you really prove that the prices are being gouged so as long as they can justify their prices or whatever whatever it is they're doing to leverage over consumers it's like a there's no comparison it's like well there's like maybe one or two companies and they're both doing the same thing so we just have to assume this is how it is and so you kind of get in this, this sort of like broken you know this these these economies of broken windows where you're paying the window makers to repair your windows because they're walking around breaking your windows every afternoon and uh, you know you could be buying something else but you have to spend all your money on windows because these guys are allowed to just just break these rules um so so you need to regulate your market somewhat and that's actual economics 101 you know uh, it's not just about like well there's there's no invisible hand you know when people get too powerful and they start cheating you do need a referee to step in and say like okay hey knock it off and and the good thing about if you were to be effective with that if you were acting frequently then you wouldn't have to like break up companies you wouldn't get monopolies in the first place you would just have competition ongoing and the markets would be very healthy and then you'd have this you'd have this phenomenal system of capitalism that everyone always thinks that we have which we don't really have anymore you know our regulators are incredibly <laughs> They'll go after smaller companies well enough, but then you hear about like, uh, you know, the Boeing crashes, and it's like, well, what was the, what were the regulators doing? And they were like, oh, well, they let Boeing regulate themselves. I'm like Boeing is a good company. Why wouldn't we do that? It's like, all right, yeah. So, um, yeah, you you need to have somebody playing referee to make sure that those markets stay competitive. But then you also get into monopoly markets. And monopoly markets are markets that naturally trend towards monopoly. Stuff like water, internet service, medicine, you know, fire. Like with medicine, for example, you don't really shop around with medicine because it's an emergency thing. You can't plan your emergency. You just have it, and then you go to the nearest hospital and you pay whatever prices they they ask for. So these types of things, which are considered kind of a public service or a public good in a lot of other nations, we treat them as private things, and. Uh, if you just let them, they would naturally become monopolies, and uh, and then as monopolies, they can be corrupt. And this is the real danger. When people talk about well, communism, uh, what they're really railing against is a monopoly. That, like if you if you just take all the companies and you just give them to the government, well, then you just have a monopoly, and and this monopoly is like controlling things that are not even necessarily monopoly markets. It's like you've just allowed a single widget company. To decide everything about widgets, you know, and that's why it doesn't work. It's because monopolies are uh, are incredibly dangerous, and so it's good to be wary of the government holding a monopoly, because you you need to prevent that sort of thing. But what needs to happen then is there just needs to be a lot of really tight rules on those monopoly markets. And so you see, in some places, we allow like private water ownership or private power ownership uh, in the United States. And then there's just a lot of rules about what they can do. So they're not allowed to price gouge. They're not, you know, they do this and they do that. They practically have to go through the government to raise prices. And the companies, those private companies, don't like that because it limits their earning potential. You know, they could be explosively rich and powerful if they could charge whatever they wanted because you have no choice but to go through this monopoly. But uh, but those those markets, they always form monopolies naturally, and you really like no amount of um, regulatory intervention prevents the monopoly from forming. You just have to to regulate it really tight so that it it doesn't abuse its power. So there are different perspectives on how you could organize that, but the the important thing is to stay grounded and realistic about what those markets are actually going to behave like, and not to get overly ideological and say like, well, we can't have rules. That's socialism, you know.
So, uh, speaking of we can't have rules, that brings us to the law and order thing. This is, I think, an opportunistic uh, load of claptrap that the Trump administration has jumped onto because they are not the law and order administration. Um, we've had these riots before during the Obama administration, and a lot of police were uh, frustrated because Obama sided, he sided with the protesters pretty, pretty definitively. Um, and the thing, with, the thing with law and order that's really challenging is that um i mean everything every like all governing is by consent i've seen some yahoos who are like no you know government is about violence whoever has the most violence has a monopoly on power but those people don't really understand the fundamentals of how a representative democracy works we are all governed by consent when we go crazy and there's like mobs in the street throwing Molotov cocktails, the police are terrified, all right? Because there's a lot of people and the police are not really equipped to deal with that many people. They can deploy, uh, they can deploy weaponry against everyone. But as you see from other nations that have these massive riots, when they get too big and they get too unruly, you know, even the military can't necessarily keep them under control. And, uh, and so it's, it's not like we're, you know, you're not governed by violence, you're governed by consent. So you need police, you need order, you need rules, and we all need to kind of agree, agree that the rules are fair, and there's this social contract that we're all following, and everything, everything is fine. And so when it comes to, like, reform, one of the most frustrating things that has emerged around this entire debate is watching Twitter hashtags take over everything. Because Twitter is an irresponsible load of garbage that just wants to promote controversy to make ad revenue. And yet people are using it to discuss really important things. So what we're seeing is this, this defund the police thing, which then you'll read is not really about defunding the police. It's just one of the most controversial things they could say to get a hashtag trending, right? So it's like it's not even what they really mean if you read about it, but it's just, it's just what they say to get promoted on social media. And uh, the fact is, is that they're, I, I mean, I can go into a whole story. I actually wanted to, to be a police officer. I applied for a job as a police officer. I actually didn't make the cut, but uh, uh, there, was, there was a lot of people applying for the job at the time. There were a lot of veterans that were coming back from, my, from Iraq. And uh, so it was kind of like, I, it wasn't really much competition. I couldn't really compete with that. So uh, uh, a lot of veterans were coming back in and and, um, and anyway, though, but I applied for that job because I was thinking to myself, I, I'd actually been part of one of the, um, there are like these cadet programs that they do where you can see what the police are like. And do, like I had a friend who was a part of that and he was like, you ought to come, you ought to come hang out. It's like really interesting. You get to see what all, the police are all about and everything like that. And, uh, and I got into that and I met a lot of cops through that program. And, uh, some of those guys were, were great individuals. And like, I really, I've been thinking a lot about their well-being in this current environment because I know the ones, the people that I, that, that I can vouch for, I know would never deserve the violence that's being perpetrated against some of these police officers. And I know that like when you hear about these, these cops getting assaulted or being, you know, like stabbed in the face or whatever by, by crazy people, those people who are doing those attacks, they don't know those cops personally. It's not like they're making some kind of judgment on them that's qualitative it's just like they're just attacking cops because they wear the uniform and so i think about those cops that i like and uh, and i you know i would never want harm to befall those people but there were some cops that were a little out there like you met some of those guys and they were a little like you could tell the hours really wore on them and they were a little cagey you know uh there were also some of them who were incredibly morose i met a i met a one of the uh forensics guys you got to see a lot of dead bodies, and and boy, did that guy have a dark sense of humor. <laughs> he was, um, boy, he was used to seeing death, that's for sure. So, it's it's, um, I mean, it's a difficult job. No matter how you slice it, no matter what reforms you throw at it, and what you're going to do with it, police work is necessary and incredibly difficult. And one of the reasons why we, why we you would want to look up to it as a society. One of the reasons why we look at it as a thing is like the, the cops are good guys is because it's such a difficult job and you really need good people in it. And so when I applied to be a cop, I was thinking like, well, one of my good virtues is that I'm pretty patient. And so I think if you called me out and like every Friday night, I was talking to this exact same family about that, you know, I was another domestic dispute with the Robinsons, you know, 
Um, I was thinking I could handle that. Like I, I could be someone who could go out and and and, uh, and handle this and do this. And I'm not a very big guy, so I worried a little bit about like could I, like if when it comes to like physical altercations, somebody fighting me, like trying to stab me or something like that. Would I do very well with that? Like I think I'd have a harder time there. But there are female cops, I reason. So being a little being a little guy is probably not that big of a deal. I, I think the social aspects are very important, and a lot of times. You're doing like routine traffic co- stops, you know, drunk drivers, that sort of thing. And most of the job, from my perspective, I believe is is about patience and just dealing with, you know, the banality of human existence and everything like that. And so, so the thing that that gets me though is uh, when you hear about like police who just turn off their cameras. And then, like, the suspect dies, and there's, like, no, you know, the cameras are supposed to be on, and you're supposed to see what have actually happened, but it's just like, yeah, all the cameras were off, and then the suspect died, or was beaten mercilessly, you know? And it's kind of like, uh, those are those, like, you just know it's those really weird, cagey guys who had a lot of opinions about right and wrong, who got into the police force because they wanted to, like, bring the hammer down. Like I said, I was going into it thinking, like, domestic disputes are the most common thing you go to see. Like, I'm going to be patiently talking to a lot of families, asking them, you know, who, who got stabbed? Why'd you do the stabbing? All right, all right, Luann, you know the you know the drill. Get in the back of the car. Uh, you know, your husband's not going to press charges, but uh, it's not a very vicious stabbing, so uh, I'll, I'll see you next week. You know, that 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 was uh, that's what I was thinking. But you get some guys who get into that whole thing, and they're, like, thinking power trip. You know, I'm going to shut people down, and that's what they get into it for, and that's the wrong mentality. And those guys get in it, and they, they do things that they should not do. And uh, and so when you talk about police reform, it's stuff like it, it should not be allowed for cameras to turn off. Because with there are situations where if you're doing good police work, a lot of times the camera could, should demonstrate that. Like they'll be able to review what happened and they'll see like, all right, so you follow procedure and everything's fine. And this is a really difficult job. So we understand that. But when it gets into this sort of like, you know, a cop can just turn off the camera and then someone dies and then you, you can't prosecute it because there's like no evidence and the rules are really strict. Like that all kind of needs to be altered. I, I, what, can I, what can I say? It's, it's clear. I mean, you can't, you can't kill a guy in broad daylight by sitting on his neck and then get away with it. I, I, like all this rhetoric, all this like racist crap that I'm seeing about like, oh, you know, that guy deserved it. Like nobody knew that guy before he died. Like, it was, I mean, people, his friends knew him, but, like, the cops that killed him did not know that guy. Like, they were called in because they thought he passed off a counterfeit 20, which, again, in my opinion, that was the type of thing I was thinking about when I applied to the force. I'd come out and be like, hey, man, so, uh, someone reported you had a counterfeit 20. And it's such a, like, that's such a minor thing. Like, a counterfeit $20 bill. You can just pick those up. There's so many counterfeits in circulation. When I was selling stuff at conventions... I used to, like, I was really worried that I was going to, like, try to hand off a $100 bill and someone was going to be like, this is a counterfeit because that happened to somebody. Like, that was a, we got a, a an email about that. They were like, hey, heads up. Uh, one of our, our vendors tried to give $100 to the bank and the bank told them it was a fake $100 bill. So they had the $100 taken away and now that guy's just out $100. They weren't, like, prosecuted or anything like that because because if you don't know it's a it's a counterfeit, you got swindled. So it's, it's one of those things, you know... Um, I was worried about that just from just from selling stuff at a convention. I would never come out and be like, "Well, I'm gonna mess this guy up," you know. I'm gonna I'm gonna end his life. It's one of those patience things. And then like he was like, "Well, I'm claustrophobic. I don't want to go in the police car again." It's like it's a patience thing. It's just like yeah, you know. Um, but you have to go in the car, I got, you know. And it's it's it, it it blows me away. And to see people defending that conduct, I, I feel is wrong. And so it's, it's like, I, I like to think I have a pragmatic take on many things, and I do not feel that I've seen very much pragmatism coming out of a lot of the most popular right-wing talking points, and even some of you guys who are coming in in defense of the right-wing, and you're saying, like, well, the law and order, and, and, and the Democrats have lost their minds and everything like that, like, I know, I know who's talking to you. I also know that probably you're deriving a lot, like most of you are on a script, and you don't realize this, but you're on a script because a lot of what you're being shown, it's being shown to you by uh, an algorithm. Like a bot network is informing you 
And so all your arguments are coming from a bot network, and you wind up sounding like machines because you're learning from a machine. It's just an algorithm that's telling you about this stuff. It's like, here's these Twitter posts you need to see because you'll engage with them, and that produces a lot of ad revenue for us. So those people on the left wing who are, who are you know, saying defund the police, they're in the exact same sand trap as you in the right wing who, are, who think that the, the left has gone mad. The left hasn't gone mad, it's just that the only way that they can discuss anything, the only way anything gets trending on social media is by being audacious. And the same goes for you on the right wing. By being audacious, you get promoted. And there's a lot of money there in that kind of thing. Uh, like I say, I think in 2015 there was a huge boom in the social justice stuff because there was a lot of money to get up there and, and accuse white people of being wrong for being white. Uh, or to accuse, you know, it's to say men need to be re-educated. That was the thing that was happening, and I think that was wrong then, and it was sensational, and it was just a way for Twitter and Facebook and YouTube to make money off of off of your personal suffering. And those of you right now who are who, who believe that the left are trying to, dis to destroy the police, like this is the same thing. It's just it's just Google and Facebook and Twitter. It's, they're just making money off of your fear. This is what's informing you. This is not none of this is real. And Donald Trump is like the penultimate realization of this awful so social media environment that we're in right now. Where he gets on Twitter and gets a ton of engagement because he's just like saying this crazy radical stuff. It's incredibly sensational, but very valuable to Twitter to have it, at least as far as their ad revenue goes. So, so Trump is like the Twitter president, as far as I'm concerned. And I hate everything about this Twitter environment and everything that's, that's been going on with all of this. And I, I think it needs to stop. And I think Trump needs to get out of office. Because I'm, I'm sick of Twitter president. Like, I'm not impressed with Joe Biden. I don't honestly think that he's really moving that far towards anything that needs to happen in this country. But for God's sakes, at least he's not basically just a, a reflection of our awful social media algorithms. You know, he's, he's an old guy who's protecting his, his political investors, which is not great. But gosh, you know, gosh dang it, at least he's not freaking Facebook. So... That's, that's where I am. I think Trump needs to go because he's as dangerous as these social media algorithms that are killing public discourse. And I don't think that he's demonstrated any capacity for the job. Nothing he's done really seems to imply to me that he's a good president. Now, some of you disagree, and most of the reasons I'm seeing for the disagreement, again, come from this, this like, well, the president said he did a good job, and you personally believe him. And, and I'm telling you that most of what he says is... It, I mean, he himself has admitted that he is a compulsive liar, which is the strangest thing to me. That is that is the weirdest thing about it, is that Trump himself has even admitted, like, he doesn't really tell the truth very often. But but for some reason, it's just sort of like, I, again, I think it's branding, where it's like, well, he's the Republican leader, and, you know, the Republicans are like the good Christian guys, you know, so so being the embodiment of, like, basically all the cardinal sins is, is you know, that's that not the Republican way, and so therefore, if the, if the president says he did a good job, then I trust he did a good job, you know? I have to, because otherwise, you know, what is he? Is he, like, some kind of crazy false prophet or something like that? I don't want to believe that's what I voted for. But frankly, I think, I think, I think you were fooled by an awful social media program. Uh, you were fooled by an awful social media system, and, and you're taking a very stupid, irresponsible man's words at face value, and, and uh, I understand that maybe the politics that prove that he's wrong is, is quite boring. And I'm not saying you have to read into it to, to develop your opinion. But, um, man, like, if you, if you really think that Facebook and if you think social media is full of crap, and I know that you do, then I just, I urge you, please do not vote based on a sense of, of, of uh, fear. I mean... I don't know, someone was saying, like, I'm reconsidering my stance for Trump, and all I can say to that guy is, the best thing you can do for yourself is try to figure out what you personally get out of your vote. If, if your guy wins, what are you going to get? Like, what is that candidate promising? And, and right now, Trump's not promising anything. He's promising to hurt a lot of people. You know, he's, he's saying that everyone's going to hurt you if he doesn't get voted for, but Trump himself is not really promising you much of anything. And Biden's not promising you a whole lot either, but he is at least saying that he's going to consider fixing health care. And, you know, I, like, I don't know what that plan entails. But, you know, at least it's a promise of getting something. 
Um, maybe he'll promise us more later on, or maybe not. Maybe he'll just sit on his hands and and uh, make huge returns on his stocks, assuming that the stocks don't crash into the dirt you know, over the next four years. But on the bright side, though, if Biden gets into power and there really is an economic crash, you can trust he's not going to get reelected, and you'll have a Republican in for the next cycle. So it's not like it's not like letting Trump go is the end of the Republican Party, and and. They want you to fear that it is, but it, it really is not. Just, there are probably smarter Republicans. There are there are probably more dangerous Republicans by that extension, like people who would actually take control of the country. But uh, but I wouldn't overestimate. I wouldn't underestimate Trump because you actually see in a lot of places where they have totalitarian governments, the leadership is actually incredibly stupid, like hilariously stupid in some cases. Like uh, like uh, some of them some of them are like really really dumb. But they get in control anyway, and then they just like they just obliterate their country, and everyone's like starving and in poverty. But they, they just firebomb riots, so you can't you know you can't protest. And, uh, yeah. So um, yeah, I think Trump is dumb, but I don't think that dumb people are incapable of forming dictatorships. And so uh, uh, you know I don't know. Like he he doesn't really know what he wants. He doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't understand anything. But he wants the power. And I, I, my concern with Trump is that he's going to do things to try to maintain power. And he's already done a lot of things to maintain his power, or to try to maintain face, that, that are considered, they were previously considered lines that could not be crossed, for ethical reasons. But the guy just has no scruples, you know, like he just doesn't, he just doesn't care. So I mean, you can vote Republican then, that's fine, but just, just, just please try to like, I'd, I'd really love it if you would vote in someone with like a lot of, with like a good conscience, you know, if you would try to look for a Republican who has some compassion in his heart for other people and a little bit of sincerity, you know, like it's, it's all I can ask. If, if you, if you can't get away from your brand, then at least just try to ask more of your brand. So yeah, uh, I, I don't know that I'll do a lot more of these, but, um, you know, like I said, somebody left my Patreon because I was too political. So, ergo, I'm gonna go full tilt political. I'll show you political. Who? You thought this was the. You thought you leave, I'll be less political. I'll show you. Uh, yeah. So, so that's it. Thanks for joining me, everybody. I'll catch you next time.